still brave enough to be here at St. Con on a Friday at 11 o'clock, you're about to see something amazing. I would love, it gives me great honor and pleasure to introduce one of the most talented security people I've ever had the opportunity to uh, meet and collaborate with. And it just so happens that he's also my brother-in-law, which makes it really cool, because we get to collaborate more often on family things and stuff. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Seth Johnson. Okay. Hopefully I can stand here a little bit close and it's not going to mess up the mic. Yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, today I want to talk about uh, social engineering and how I got in, uh, social engineered into giving this talk here at St. Con and a number of others. Um, to start out with, though, I want to get rid of some disclaimers. I'm going to talk about some things in this talk that uh, have some conditions. Uh, the first one is there's no warranty for this. I can't guarantee that it will do anything that you want. I can't even guarantee that it will do anything that I want, although I would certainly like to. Uh, and I, there are no claims that you can make against me in relation to this presentation. Second of all, by being in this presentation, you agree to the terms represented here. Uh, you give me royalty-free access to your information as well as you will not reverse engineer, decompile, or disassemble the presenter, please. Uh, I will be using all the information that you disclose and it's my right to do so and this uh, information may be updated at any time with or without your consent. Uh, also, any reproduction, recording, transcription, transmission, or other use of this presentation in whole or in part without written consent is prohibited. That's for you guys over there at the AV desk. So, uh, I know everyone has some questions that we've got to get through to begin with, and uh, we're mostly not going to do that. I just want to answer the burning question in everyone's minds, which is, when does the social engineering start in this talk? And the answer is right now. Uh, while we're talking about right now, I'd like to share an inspirational quote. The wheel turns and turns and turns. It never stops, and it stands still. Who who's feeling inspired right now? Confused? Great, OK. No subtle hints or anything are included in this talk. All right, um, how many of you have been to a talk that I've given before? A couple of you, okay. How many of you are ready for story time? Great. So, we're gonna, we're gonna get down to story time. Uh, in many of my talks, one of the things that I like to do is tell stories about real life, things that I've done or things that have happened to me. Uh, in social engineering, usually I'm the target because it's fun to have someone who's a social engineer be the target. And uh, it's also fun as a social engineer to target others and uh, elicit some interesting behavior. The first story that I want to tell is, of course, about Jupiter and uh, St. Con in general. So you, you shouldn't have provided me that picture. So uh, we started planning St. Con in pretty much November of last year, and we've been working on it for a long time. And all the committee members have put in a lot of work for this. However, uh, thank you, yes. For all the committee members, thank you very much. Um, there, there also comes a time when the committee members are asked to do more. And sometimes it comes from very direct sources, like, Troy coming to me and saying, hey, Seth, will you speak at St. Con? But this year, I got it through a new vector. I got an email from someone on the leadership track saying, Seth, Troy said that you would be a great addition to our leadership track this year. We'd love to have you speak. And so I, I, I received the email. I read it. And I thought, dang it, uh, I'm going to try and be a team player 
but I wanted to avoid giving a number of talks this year. I wanted to focus on some other things. So I sent back a nice message, both to Troy and to the leadership track people, suggesting a couple of different ideas and that they should pick one of those ideas for me to give a talk on. Who recognized the fatal flaw in that story? All right, so uh, the next story that I want to talk about is escalators. Escalators are fun. Escalators are here. Escalators are fun while they're here. And there are lots of people who are here with us. Uh, a lot of social engineering can be done very simply with uh, a minimum amount of tools. So uh, last night, I made some plans and modified my talk to include the escalators because I thought that would be fun. And this morning I woke up early, got upstairs to our printer, and printed out a sign. I placed it in one of the official devices here on the campus and placed it immediately in front of the escalator. Uh, I'm disappointed that we only have a black and white printer because I think color would have been far more effective. But uh, we, we placed this thing right in front of the escalator, as you can see with the picture, and then sat back and watched and counted. Uh, the next story I want to talk about is uh, last year giving a social engineering talk. I think on this stage, we talked about social engineering and threat modeling. How many of you were here for that? Two people? OK. Well, then this is going to be a little bit less fun for you. Uh, we discussed how threat modeling works, and if you're a security professional, you might already know this. If you're not, I'm going to just briefly explain. Threat modeling is assessing all the different threats that you have and the ways in which they might interact with you or prevent you from achieving your objectives. Uh, and there's an entire apparatus to do so, figuring out what you can do to deal with those threats. And we discussed it at length last year in St. Con about how to do that. During the question and answer period, someone decided to ask me, so with this threat modeling thing, do you just do that around Thanksgiving dinner with your family? And I, I didn't have an answer for that yet. Uh, but it sounded interesting, and I had never done threat modeling at Thanksgiving dinner before. Uh, for those of you who know me and have been around me, my response to that, of course, is, that's a great idea. We should try that. I think it's incredibly important for us to figure out how to do threat modeling in family dinner situations. Um, I might be the first person who's ever tried this, but it was fascinating, so I liked the idea, and I decided to accept this challenge with great vim and vigor. Uh, it also worked out very fortuitously because St. Con last year was right before Thanksgiving, as it is this year. And so uh, I decided that I wanted to go to Thanksgiving dinner and do some threat modeling assessments on my family members and from a social engineering perspective. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is a visit that I had to a restaurant. And uh, this restaurant will remain nameless, but I had a situation in which I was social engineered by a menu. Oh, thanks, Matt. Hold on one moment. Delicious. All right. Um, I was, I was social engineered by a menu at a restaurant. It turns out that on the menu for the drinks, there were two particular items that caused a great deal of what is usually known as cognitive dissonance for me personally. Uh, you can see these two menu items seated right next to each other on the screen. The one on the right is lemonade. The one on the left is limonata. That's right. Uh, one named in English and one named in Italian. Because, of course, the restaurant, which will not be named, is an Italian restaurant. Uh, for those of us who have uh, spent some time learning some other languages, that's a problem. I don't know which thing to order. Uh, so I decided to discuss this with my group and with the server 
to try and resolve this concern. The last part of story time that I want to share is a visit to a clothing retail establishment where they have these rooms. I don't know what they're called. Does anyone know what these are called? Changing rooms? Dressing rooms? Fitting rooms? They're called one of those things. And uh, the one that I went to is actually different than the picture here. Yeah. I did not go to a place like this because, clearly. Yeah, so uh, the place that I did go to had full-length doors all the way down. And if you've ever been to one of these places, you know that it's um, always hit or miss about whether or not you can actually get into one of these rooms. And it becomes even more complex the moment those doors shut. How many of you have been in that situation? The doors are shut and you don't know if anybody's in there. It's difficult, right? And it's, it's hard to be polite and also get stuff done because nobody wants to stay there forever waiting for those doors to open. So uh, I took care of my family member who was trying some things on. And then I sat there and waited because I was not trying anything on. And another woman came up and looked down the hall of these very closed doors and said, it looks like everything is closed. I said, well, maybe there have been some of those doors that have been closed for a long time. And then I suggested there's probably a way that we could figure out which doors have people behind them and which doors do not. So now that we've talked about story time, let's talk about some of the motivations that work with social engineering. Everyone wants to know, why does social engineering work? And I'm going to answer that in one word. Reasons. Reasons are the way that social engineering works because people are motivated by reasoning. And sometimes that reasoning is inhibited by emotion. One of the emotions that prevents us from making great reasoning judgments is authority. How many of you have been influenced in a social setting by authority? How many of you are being influenced by an authority right now? Thank you. I appreciate it. How many of you kept your hands down because I said that? Two of you. All right, great. Um, authority helps us to do things, makes us do things that we didn't necessarily want to do or plan on doing. Authority uh, can be a good thing. Sometimes it makes us go to our jobs and treat our bosses nicely. And uh, authority can be a bad thing as well. But authority is a motivator that drives people to specific behaviors. I have seen authority used in a number of ways, both for good and for bad. And I'm going to probably be using it a number of times in the rest of this talk. But I'd also like to point out that in some of these stories, authority was actually used. For example, in speaking at St. Con, someone referenced an authority, and that was enough to get the hook in. Authority is also used in a lot of situations, such as in phishing emails. It's very easy with a phishing email to suggest that someone in authority wants you to transfer that money, even if that person does not want you to transfer that money. And that's a high value target for a lot of the phishing emails that are going out today. Uh, authority is often a powerful motivator and can be combined with other things as well. Uh, one of the other motivators I would like to talk about is avoidance. How many of you have avoided something? You have experience with this, you know what it looks like? How many of you have avoided someone at this conference? Don't want to talk to that person. Thank you, Matt, for raising your hand. I appreciate it. When things are uncomfortable or disagreeable, we often go to perhaps great efforts and great lengths to avoid getting into those situations. When we do that, we have a particular set of behavior that can be reproduced. Social engineers can use this to their advantage. 
if you are a social engineer, you can present a scenario to someone which they would like to avoid, and they will likely not choose that path. If you are being social engineered and someone is exhibiting this sort of behavior on you, it is helpful to pull your head up out of the sand and take a look around. Another motivating factor for most people is a desire to be good and help others. Uh, very often, this desire is used in social engineering settings to do things such as asking someone to hold a door open for you while you're carrying a very large box which may or may not have anything in it. Uh, sliding in behind someone or holding the door open for someone else. All of those things are couched in this nature that we have to help one another in a, in a social setting. When we do that, we are providing social value and we feel better about ourselves and lift the community. I'm giving a talk today because I want to help you. It worked on me. Fear is a very powerful motivator. Uh, it's one of my least favorite motivators. I don't like it very much. I don't even like scary movies. Uh, I don't like to use this with other people, but it can be used. Very often, this is used in a number of phone call sorts of scenarios or email sorts of scenarios with extortion. Uh, how many of you have received an extorting email based on a fear motivator in the past six months? A lot of you. I've turned on your webcam, I've seen you, or if you don't, do, if you don't give me a bunch of um, iTunes gift cards, then the IRS will be coming after you. Those are very interesting fear-based motivators that have great effect on a lot of people. Fear can go all the way to sending to uh, threats that is even more powerful depending on Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how desperate that person can be. Just one moment. It's great lemonade. Um, this sort of fear-based motivator is incredibly malicious, and I would advocate that as social engineers, we should avoid using this. If someone is using this against you, you should push back and possibly even notify the authorities. On the flip side of that, one of the other things that is a great motivator for people is this idea of hope. Hope can be a motivator for a number of things. One of those things is the optimism bias. How many of you believe that you're not going to get in a car accident on your way home today? Everybody raise your hands. You don't think that's going to happen. Um, I really hope that it doesn't for all of you. Uh, and I plan on driving home in my car today because of that hope, because of that optimism bias. When we have something to hope for or something to look forward to, we often perform additional actions to be able to get there. Another thing that you may have noticed in this talk or perhaps in the conference center around today are visual cues and signs. These visual cues and signs take advantage of pre-established conditions and ideas that you already have in your head. With inside the human brain, there are a number of pathways that are established that are faster because they've been used multiple times. You do these kinds of things all the time without thinking about it. Most of you did not have to think to walk up the stairs or to sit in your chair. You don't have to think to lean back in your chair, and you probably don't even think about it if the chair squeaks that you stop leaning back in your chair. All those things are cues that happen naturally. And when you compare that, when you pair that up with a situation in which there are social norms involved, that can also be a powerful motivator. How many of you have seen a social cue or sign today that influenced your behavior? Anyone want to shout out an example for us? What's that? Ballroom A? You wanted to go to a talk there? Okay. You saw the sign, you walked in. 
Great news. You've been social engineered to walk into Ballroom A. St. Con did it. Nice work. Uh, there's also an idea of inertia inside of social settings. Things that you have done in the past, you're more likely to do again. And things that you are already doing, you're more likely to continue. For example, if you came to the first three days of St. Con, you're likely to be here on day four. There are a number of people who aren't here on day four, but the majority of people are. Uh, this sort of thing is very useful in social engineering by creating a scenario that either looks like or is a similar path that gets someone to do something to an attacker's advantage. Praise and flattery is also an effective tool that helps social engineers to get what they want. It feels great to be praised. It feels great to have Troy come up here and say that he's enjoyed working with me. That may or may not be a motivator as to why I'm giving this talk, but it feels great to have someone say nice things about you. When someone says nice things about you, you feel like they have your best interests at heart. That may not necessarily be the case. Many uh, manipulative social engineers use this tactic to great effect. Next, uh, liking, and this has a couple of different contexts. One is you are far more likely to do something because someone you like has endorsed it or suggested it. Some of you may be here today at this talk because someone told you that this would be a good talk and you might be feeling a little disappointed right now. Uh, some of you are here today because you know me and you like me and you think this is a great talk. Let's raise our hands for those people. One person, okay. So we're doing great here, really appreciate that uh, vote of confidence. Um, does it help if I say that I like you? How many more hands can I get with that? I got a thumbs up, three, four, ten, zero, nothing. Uh, generally, this uh, entire idea is encased in the, the notion of building rapport. When you have rapport with someone, you're more likely to engage with them, and you're more likely to do what they ask. You're more likely to enjoy interacting with them. And this can be very helpful. It can be very detrimental. This rapport is also used for celebrity kinds of endorsements. How many of you have seen a celebrity endorsement for a political candidate or for a product that is entirely unrelated to their experience? Yeah, you've seen that all the time. You have very prominent uh, people in the cinematic industry endorsing political candidates. You should vote for this person because as a person who makes movies, I would know. Uh, people who play sports endorsing restaurants where they probably don't even eat because of their training regimen. Uh, those kinds of things end up being rapport building situations. I'm far more likely to buy food at McDonald's if LeBron James eats at McDonald's simply because I like LeBron James. And all of those things are used in a situation to create behaviors or disclose information from people in social engineering settings. Uh, then there's also the social proof or social inhibitors. Uh, for those of you who are staying at hotels today, or have been during this week, how many of you saw the little placard in the bathroom? Do you know what I'm talking about? The one that says, hey, we're trying to save the planet. If you want to keep your towels, hang them up. If you want them changed, throw them on the floor. They've gone to uh, interesting lengths to improve the effectiveness of those messages. In fact, recent research suggests that if they put on there some numeric values and relate it to the room that you are in, you are far more likely to not have them replace your towels. So instead of saying, hey, we're trying to save the planet, you should not be a jerk, and you should hang up your towels, if they say, 
56% of the people in this room have hung their towels back up and have saved the planet, you are far more likely to do the same because you can see that situation and you relate to those people who were in that room before you even though you know nothing about them. That's incredibly powerful social proof. On the flip side, when you see those signs, some of you might be thinking, I know what you're doing here. You're not interested in saving the planet one bit. You are trying to save money and put more money back into your pockets as a hotel. I don't know the answer to that motivation, but either one of those things is an impetus for them to put up that placard. And perhaps both of those things will result in the situation that is desired, meaning the hotel will likely save more money and you will likely do something to save the planet by not putting your towels on the floor, which I would encourage you to do, perhaps not because of the sign, but because I said so. Uh, recycling. How many of you have seen the recycling sign on this can? Wow, okay, two of you. How many of you are blind? Great, three of you. Recycling is a very powerful social impetus. We all are interested in the future of the planet to one degree or another. And recycling bins are often clearly marked, such as this one. But these recycling bins can also be misused. How many of you have thrown something in a recycle bin that doesn't belong there? Okay, a couple of you. Any reasons why you did that? What's that? It was close by. Ooh, laziness. I didn't add that to my talk. Okay, we're going to pretend like there's a slide here for laziness. That's a great motivator. Not doing stuff. That will definitely motivate you. How many of you want to do laziness later on this afternoon after the conference? Great. How many of you are doing it right now? Sweet. Um, the notion from a social setting that recycling is better for the planet is so pervasive, even people who can't read those words but can see the symbol are impelled to follow those instructions. Uh, the next one, and this is one of the most powerful ones for me personally, is commitment. When you commit to do something, you are far more likely to do that than when you don't. My children are the best at getting this to happen. Uh, this goes, ranges from everything to, from bedtime stories to attending St. Con. Dad, you promised that you would read to me two bedtime stories. Okay, fine, I'll do it. Uh, you promised you would bring me to St. Con this year. He's here. Uh, how many of you have been motivated by your commitments? A couple of you. Any interesting situations you've been impelled to, to follow through on? You bought a ticket to St. Con? Yeah, and you told me you would, so you kept your promise. So glad that you did. Uh, I'm here up in front of you speaking today because I said I would and because someone put it on the schedule, so I'm trying to keep my word too. Uh, the next one that I want to talk about is concessions. Uh, although this one references the concession stand where you're likely to pay far more for items than you should, uh, the concession that I'm talking about is I'm getting you to give me something, and when I do that, I'm far more likely to get more after the fact. For example, when someone sends me an email saying, hey, Seth, we'd like you to speak at SaintCon, and I send them back, here are a few ideas, please choose one. Their email coming back to me says, those sound great. I agreed to do one talk and found myself to be doing more. Uh, we often put ourselves into these situations and we don't want to have that socially awkward feeling where you've given someone something and they ask for more and you don't really want to, but you feel like you need to. You feel like you have to give 
just one more hour of SaintCon to listen to this talk go on, or you feel like you have to wait until the end of the awards at Hackers Challenge because you have that hope that you might have won. Spoiler alert, you probably didn't. Um, all, of the, all of those things are concessions that you make. When I ask Matt for a lemonade, he says, yes, I'll give that to you. And then I tell him, I need you to come to my talk because I need people in my talk. And then I need you to come up on stage and get my lemonade to me. Right? Did Matt bring me a lemonade in this talk? Yes, he did. Why? I just asked him for a lemonade. Speaking of lemonade, this is delicious. Oh. Can you hold this for me for just a minute? Hold my lemonade. Yeah, hold it. You have to hold it. Just hold it. <clears throat> there may or may not be some incentives involved, but we're getting to greed later, so hold on. All right, so um, the, the next one is scarcity or the fear of missing out. How many of you have purchased an item on an electronic retailer such as Amazon? Okay. How many of you have seen that little text at the bottom, there's only X number of this left on the planet thing, right? <laughs> Sold out almost. Or you're booking a hotel. 75 people have booked this hotel in the past three minutes. There are only 20 rooms in the hotel, guys. Like, how does that work? Well, we meant like in the entire world, and we meant for the rest of all time. Like, the more you can make that scarcity appear, the deeper that influence goes. This influence worked very well for a large marketing and filmmaking organization, generally characterized by a, an animated mouse, where they put cinematic productions into what was called the vault. How many of you remember that? How many of you hated that? That's artificial scarcity. It was created for the purpose of motivating you to go out and buy that film immediately. All of these things incentivize you from the perspective of you don't want to miss out. You don't want to be the one who doesn't have whatever movie that was, the special edition, the platinum edition, the one with the director's cut that I'm sure you've never seen. Uh, this is also an incredibly powerful motivator in situations where people are far less well off than you. Uh, in third world countries where they have much fewer resources than we do, Scarcity is a really powerful motivator. If there's not enough food, people will do incredible things to try and get that. Uh, in the end, scarcity as a generic motivator is based as a subset, I believe, of the concept of fear. Uh, the next one, of course, is greed. Hey, what happened? You gotta hold it. Hold my lemonade. Um, the greed is a powerful motivator and is often used in scams online and in person, as you can see today. Uh, we all want things, and we often want things for free. Sometimes we want things for a little amount of effort. This is why the Nigerian prince is so awesome in the world today. Uh, I don't know how much money that person has been able to make, but incentivizing people by saying, if you give me this tiny thing, I will give you all of this stuff. All of this stuff ends up being the greed. And it's a very powerful motivator. Uh, a number of you have come to Saint Con today because of a badge that you get to take home. In the past, we've done some interesting experiments with greed at St. Con. Uh, a number of years ago, for uh, one of the things that we gave out at St. Con, we gave out a Raspberry Pi. Do you remember this? And we, we sent out an email 
to the participants of SaintCon and suggested to them that they needed to pay a remaining X number of dollars and cents, some random amount, to be able to pick up their Raspberry Pi. And that X number of dollars and cents was very small, and the value of the Raspberry Pi is very big, so people were incentivized to react to that. We had people come to the registration desk all day asking who they paid and how they need to pay that so they could get their Raspberry Pi. If you think that you, as a security person or as a hacker, are immune to this, you are very wrong. And as proof of that, I would like to return you to your schedule next week when you go back to work. You want money in your pocket, so somehow you're motivated to go back to that job. Honestly, though, I hope your job's better than that. Uh, next is reciprocation. If I do something for you, you're far more likely to do something for me. I promised Matt that if he brought me some lemonade, he would get a show. You still holding that lemonade? Sweet, yes. And he brought me the lemonade. This is a reciprocal relationship. Uh, this works both in professional relationships, social engineering relationships, and even romantic relationships. Give and take is there. Um, when all of those things come together, we create a scenario in which social engineering is a very, very powerful force. Social engineering can be used to turn all kinds of things into very different scenarios, and reciprocation helps to grease those wheels to say, you're getting something out of this too. And then uh, as my next slide, I'd like to present to you blank. All right, so let's get back to story time. How many of you want to complete story time? Great. So uh, back to the retail establishment selling clothing. The doors are closed. You can't see it under them to see if there are feet there. And I'm sitting here with this woman who I do not know, who wants to know whether or not someone is in those rooms. I suggest to her that there has not been anyone coming in or out for several minutes, so the likelihood is very high that there's no one in there. And then the next thing that I said was, would you like me to knock on those doors and find out? I'll do it if you're afraid to do that. To which she responded, don't worry, I'll do it. Even the suggestion of fear is an interesting motivator. She was not afraid of me, but she might have been afraid of looking like she was not able to do that for herself, even though I was perfectly willing to do that either way. Um, <clears throat> next, let's talk about the lemonade. Actually, I'd like my lemonade back. That's delicious. Thank you very much. I, I, I'll, I'll have something for you later. Maybe. It's going to be an empty can of lemonade. Oh, let me drink it really quick. So, uh, uh, in, in this particular case, is this limonada? I don't know. No, it says lemonade. Okay. Uh, in this particular case, I ordered neither of these menu items. And then uh, at the conclusion of this event in this restaurant, I went there, I was with family, I left, and I was just disowned. I don't know what happened, but it was no longer a family situation. <laughs> Going back to Thanksgiving dinner, uh, so because someone suggested it at St. Con and I was up for the challenge, I decided to perform some social engineering threat modeling at Thanksgiving dinner. And I'm probably going to do it again this year because it was super fun. Um, well, I can't reveal the characteristics of everyone in my entire family or name their names because that's probably way inappropriate with this particular group. I'd like to share with you the Thomas Kilman instrument for conflict resolution. And I'd like to tell you about the different people in my family using animals. Uh, there are a number of people in my family who do not like conflict. They hate it. In fact, whenever conflict shows up, they, like a turtle, pull their heads back in or go to another room. 
I have some people in my family who are very accommodating like the teddy bear and they'll just cuddle up to you. They're so excited to be there and probably are dying on the inside. Uh, I have the people who love that reciprocity, giving things and taking things. They're the fox that's always trying to compromise and get something going on, get something for themselves and maybe give you just a little bit. Uh, you have the wise people who are clearly ready to collaborate with you on anything from opening up the oven to slicing the turkey. But my personal favorite are the sharks. They love to compete. They love to be right. They love to be right about everything, and they love to tell you. And I love to poke it with a stick. I love to say, no, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Um, being able to turn all of these things into a game made Thanksgiving so much more fun. I don't know if I would recommend it, although I kind of recommend it. You should probably try it. Um, that's this year. So it's going to happen. Troy, we're, we're going we're gonna to do threat modeling. It'll happen. Um, Troy, I don't know which one you are, Troy. We're going to find out. You're probably not a shark. I probably don't have to poke you with a stick then. All right, so um, anyway, that, that was a, a super exciting event for me. But uh, clearly the sharks are the most entertaining. Uh, it is also very interesting to try and use some of the compromising people and figure out what things they're willing to compromise. Uh, if you can change that dynamic and that reciprocity to be a little bit in your favor, that's fun. Uh, let's talk about the escalators. So this morning, I printed out signs, put them down in front of the escalators, and incentivized people to not use the escalators. And uh, that escalated quickly. 87% of the people who saw that sign took the stairs. Um, I had my son sitting there tallying everything. 87%. Uh, in fact, there was only one person who took the escalator by themselves when there were no other people on the escalator. And we actually went to go ask them why. And they said, well, I just needed to get there. Uh, the, the only other people who used the escalator going up were people who saw someone else already on the escalator, which tells you the power of social proof is greater than the power of my printed crap sign that was posted right in front of the escalator. Uh, I decided, however, to up the ante. And I don't know if you can read that, but it says, do not exit. I put it at the bottom of the escalator. And uh, Troy, this is payback for making me speak at St. Con. This is Troy trying to go back up the escalator after seeing that sign. It happened. Yeah, fabulous news. Uh, as far as being invited to speak at St. Con, here I am uh, telling these crazy stories in front of you. Clearly it worked on me, as social engineering always does. So what's next for you and what's next for me? I'd like to suggest something for you. Try it out. It's totally free. You don't have to pay me anything. You could be greedy about it. You can reciprocate, and I'll give you like cra crazy tips about how to have fun at Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, all of those things are great. But I would encourage you to try out social engineering. Learn how it works. Uh, when you do, you will probably also learn some interesting things, such as how the human brain works. You will learn that very often, you perform social engineering tasks on yourself every day you will start to learn that you're telling yourself that story. You are showing yourself those visual cues. You are noticing the things that keep you sane, and you'll be grateful, but you will be questioning all the time, why does this work? And what should I be scared of? What do I need to do differently? When you do that, I believe that you will be far more protected against social engineering attacks for yourself personally, and you will be capable of helping others to prevent social engineering attacks on them. Thank you very much. Any questions? That's really not that good. I think I prefer Limonata. Oh, it's for him. Greed, powerful motivator. 
All right, no questions? Great. Go enjoy the closing ceremonies and the great food. <laughs>